So this is Shell Trackside Laboratory. So it's, it's relatively new this year. We use this at race series like Le Mans, MotoGP, series where we supply fuels. And it's, it's a bigger version of the one that we actually have in the Ferrari engineering truck in the Formula 1 paddock. So, so we're confident that when the, when the fuel arrives at each race truck, it, it, it's going to meet the FIA regulations. So you think, well, well, why do we, why do we send two handlers to every race to test fuel and lubricant as well? The FIA can turn up any stage over the race weekend and take a sample of fuel, whether it be from one of the fuel drums, whether it be from the, the refueling rigs, or from the other parts of the car itself. They will do the test I'm going to explain shortly. They will do exactly the same. If they find an irregularity, typically Friday, um, we, we find quarter of a million, quarter of a million dollars. On Saturday, we put it in the back of the grid. On Sunday, we'd certainly be disqualified. So, very quickly, Shell could be front page, head, front page headlines with the wrong reasons. And that's why we, are, we take an analyst to do the fuel analysis over the race weekend. So, so what do we do? Well, every time fuel, Ferrari uh, will move fuel the drums, into the refueling rigs, and ultimately into the cars, they will, they will give us a sample of fuel. At each of those stages, like when the fuel goes into the refueling rigs, they won't move the fuel from the rig into the car before, we, before they know the fuel in the rig is fine. They will give us a sample out of the rig in a typically 100 meter can, 100 milliliter can. From that, we will decant into one of these small vials. From this vial, all we need is one microliter. So this instrument will inject one microliter. And as I won't go through the details of how it works, but it basically breaks the fuel down into its, down into, down into its individual compo uh, compounds. Typically, it's over 200 in a Formula One fuel or groups of compounds. So what you have, after 30 minutes or so, what you what that is this is what we get. This is a portion of it. I've just we've just blown it up so you can get a better idea. If you want to take a close look, there's actually two lines there. Although it looks like one, there's a blue line, which will be the sample which has been pre-approved by the FIA. Then there's the red line, which will be the sample we've we've, we've just run. And as you can see, that's exactly what we'd want to see. So it looks like one line. Two things we may see. One is where one is where peaks at the the start of the chromatogram have all gone down. That is typical of what we call weathering. So if you leave the drum, uh, the cap off a drum of fuel, all the, you can imagine all the light ends will just evaporate. That in itself is not necessarily illegal. It may be if it's warm um, at a different rate for each peak. But if it's if it's constant, then that probably wouldn't be illegal. But you wouldn't really want that because then you've lost all the power components of the fuel, or particularly the light ends. So that fuel then would not be in its optimum condition for the for the race. So that's the last thing we want as well. So this one is much is much more of an important one. If we see something like that, that peak there is, wasn't in the reference sample. So you think, oh, so where's that come from? Two place, two typical places that could come from. One, if we'd run one fuel three weeks ago in Hungary, maybe we're onto a different fuel this week in Belgium or a different batch of a fuel. Those two fuels on their own would be legal. If you mix the two of them together, there's a good chance that may that sort of thing may happen. In which case, it would be illegal. We very rarely see that. To be honest, Ferrari are very good. They are very good at housekeeping. We work, we work with them for a long time, so we very rarely see through batch contamination or fuel-to-fuel -fuel contamination. Where it's more likely that sort of thing would happen would be if you imagine the fuel system on an F1 car is quite a complicated system, so it's all encased in the actual fuel tank, unlike our our fuel systems were external to the engine. So if they've got a problem with a fuel sample, but their fuel tank or fuel system, it, it, sorry, it's a drain the tank, hands in, and they will change your fuel pump by fuel, etc. If you then put five kilos of fuel back in that tank, the grease on your finger would be enough to deem that fuel illegal. That's how sensitive that sort of thing can be. If we saw that, we'd say, well, okay, take, waste that five kilos of fuel, flush out with another five or 10 kilos, waste that, then put, give us a, put another five kilos in, give us a sample, and 99 times out of 100, that would disappear. So typically we will do 30 to 35 samples over the race weekend like that. Um, but the majority of these samples were probably done Wednesday and Thursday. For sure we'll sample the cars on Friday, Saturday and Sunday, but the majority of this work is done on Wednesday and Thursday, so we are confident that when the car goes out on the track tomorrow, then again on Saturday and Sunday, that when the FAA come and take a sample, which they will at some stage, we just don't know when, we are 100% confident that, that that situation will not happen. Lubricants are slightly different in the fact that there's no rules governing lubricants, so unlike, unlike fuels which are highly regulated, so we could basically, you, you could run the car on, I don't know, gas oil, you could run it on water if it would work, but obviously it wouldn't 
But uh, so what you say, well, why do you analyse oil at the racetrack? You're not actually looking for anything. What we use the oil for is to analyse the engine or monitor the health of the engine. So we'll take a sample of oil when they fire the car up in the morning with a new charge of oil. Uh, and then we'll take another sample every time the car comes back into the garage. Using this instrument here, which is a spectrometer, basically that will analyse the, the metals or the, the individual elements within the oil. So we monitor 15 different types of metals, so typically copper, iron, aluminium, etc. So because we've been working with Ferrari for so long and we know the metallurgy of the engine, so if an engine's done 100 kilometres, 150, 200, right up to its life of 4,000 kilometres, we know exactly how much iron, how much copper of all these different elements there should be. These are the sort of the printouts we get, so there'll be a predicted value. So on the, uh, this one, for instance, iron, after 298 kilometres, it predicted eight, eight parts per million or eight milligrams per kilogram of iron. We actually got three. Hence, that's that's blue, which is good. Blue, blue's always good. Red's bad. So you can see that <laughs> there's no red. There's no red on there. So that's that, that's quite good. So we're literally within two minutes of the car coming back into the garage. We can, you'll see tomorrow that Ferrari engineers sit upstairs from our lab. So we go up some spiral stairs, there's the results. So within two minutes they know, or we know, which conjunction with them, whether that engine is wearing abnormally or normally. If it's abnormal, depending which metal in it, which metal it is and how much, um, could indicate a problem, I don't know, with valve train, um, big end bearings, etc. So then, then Ferrari have to make a choice. They have, okay, can we alter, can we alter, um, can we alter the mapping for the engine to be able to cope with that? Back it off on, back it off on power to be able to cope, or ultimately change the engine. You know, they would they would never start a race knowing that that engine wouldn't finish because what's the point? You know, to to, to be in it, to, you've got to be you've got to be in it to win it. So there's no point running an engine if you know it's going to fail halfway through that race. So ultimately, they may change an engine, which has happened in the past, not recently. But this this analysis now is probably more important than ever because now we've only got five engines per year instead of eight. So last year the engines had to last two and a half thousand kilometres, now it's four thousand. So the big challenge as always is, okay, we, we need to produce an oil that's more highly protective, which is quite easy to do, but when you do that through the normal route, you make it, uh, you induce more friction, you lose power. So the ultimate challenge is again, we need to protect the engine for more, for more, for more mileage, but without reduction in power. So, so the big challenge as always is, Okay, we, we need to produce an oil that's more highly protective, which is quite easy to do. But when you do that through the normal route, you make it, uh, you induce more friction, you lose power. So the ultimate challenge is again, we need to protect the engine for more for more, for more mileage, but without reduction in power. So it's again, it's a big challenge for the oil formulators, just as it is on Mike on the, uh, on, the on the fuel side. So how much of a driver is it for them to change engines, this oil analysis? I mean, is that the key thing that they're like, all right, we need to switch, or do they base it on kilometers, or? No, they, they, they've, done, they've done enough bench tests in, in Marinello to know that if an engine is built normally and everything is normal, it will last the 4,000 kilometers. Okay. So, you know, you're changing the oil every time the car goes out, so we'll only do a session, change the oil, etc. cetera. Um, of course, everything is never 100% perfect right. in life. So sometimes you have to manage a situation. So to come back to that, the, the ultimate time they would have any change in engine, they've got, there's, a, there's about 550 sensors on that car. So they're monitoring, monitoring pressures, temperatures, you name it, everything that, everything on that car that moves, they, they've got they've got telemetry. I think there's like 250,000 data points or whatever. So it's, they're monitoring all this. You'll, you know, the engineers during the race are just looking at monitors and it's live time feed and all sorts. So that they, they will use telemetry. Most most problems in an engine or a car, they will see via telemetry. Okay. This is an added piece of telemetry. The classic example for us was back in 2000 or 2001. We used to have warm-up sessions then on a Sunday morning, for those of you who remember the good old days when we had to get out of bed early on a Sunday. Um, now I remember that. And after the warm-up in the session, Eddie Irvine's car showed an abnormal level of iron, or one of the metals, I forget which one it was. Ultimately, Ferrari hadn't seen anything wrong on telemetry, but they they put such faith in this in this analysis that they changed that engine. They went on to win the race with the new engine. When they took the engine back to Maranello, they stripped the engine down, proved that had they left that engine in the car, it would have failed. So to me, that's always an ultimate example. But to come back to your question, most things they will see on telemetry. Okay. So they they will they will use a whole bunch of data to make decisions. 
of which there is a huge amount of data. They have people back in Maranello mirroring what's happening at the mm -hmm. track here. And sometimes they, they will make decisions in Maranello or at the track away from a pressure environment, especially during a race. And here we can see just a few images of inside the Shell Trackside Lab, uh, which is located inside the F1 team motorhome for Ferrari in the F1 paddock.